this is Swade's Pokemon Path. Highlights. Well, this time we have a slightly improved title card. Uh, slightly, I see it. They have appropriate music, at least. I've seen some great key art for this series, and the thumbnails are awesome. You couldn't just slap them on the background? But fine, student film title aside, we have a strong opening with Ava either about to find a cabin in the woods or a school in the fog, highlighting how terrifying it must be to live in the Pokemon world along the way. If there's one thing Tears of the Kingdom taught me, it's how freaking terrifying it would be if trees could defend themselves, but that's just the world Pokemon exists in. But of course, it's actually Celestine always literally eating her dreams. Dreaming about her now, huh? And I realized that I'm so used to the anime, I actually forgot this isn't set in the actual Pokemon world. I guess that happens when you spend 10 years talking about it. But yeah, after realizing she probably needs some card sleeves now, since that one's gonna warp like heck soon, Joshua Kramer's in and he's all, It's regionals day, let's go! Joshua, what the actual heck? You're lucky I'm in my standard anime outfit. Which move did you learn? to forget freaking Dornock. Your dad said to come and get Did you. he say to give me a heart attack? No, that was the disembodied voice next to him. Kind of creepy, actually. But yeah, after a cute fusion dance reference, which could be signifying that he and Ava aren't on the same page, but that might just be me overthinking it, Josh helps her overcome her cold feet with a good old-fashioned Morpheus gambit. No one's ever beaten Celestine before. We really thought you were the one? Then we get a freaking cheering crowd at her doorstep with no parents in sight. It's a neat reference to the show, but just how tight are the schooling zones around here? Either everyone's within walking distance, or Ava's dad just went full clown car. Okay, kids, now Ava's here. Someone in the trunk's gonna have to hold their breath. Aww. I, I told you, dreams only. I'm still mad you took Ava's just now. But I can't complain too much, as there's a really cute callback to the anime with the doting mom in front of the crowd. For your rashes. Uh. The only thing missing is Ava being in her pajamas, which, given she apparently sleeps in that outfit, I guess she is. But now it's time for intrigue. Ava, there's something you should know. Gambling ring! Gambling ring! Yeah, I know it's not, but I can dream, can't I? Never mind. So they arrive at the mall for regionals, giving me annoyed flashbacks to my childhood in the third largest city in New Zealand where we never had anything nerdy. <clears throat> but Joshua is a bit skeptical of Ava's strat. The best players in the area playing the strongest decks. And you've brought... Oddish? Oh, I'm sorry. You want to disrespect Oddish some more? You want to throw some shade on the onion that beat the entire club in an afternoon? What did you decide to call it again? Oddish Khan, the classroom conqueror. That's what I thought. Besides, how do you get new metas without breaking the old one? Yeah, but first you need to know the original meta to- Whoa! Trainers, sign up for build and battle at the side of the table. Holy moly, this isn't a mall contest. This is a freaking full-size convention hall. Where the heck do they live? Ugh, I need to stop. My small city roots are showing. But now it's time for the traditional pre-tournament psych out by Celestine. You should have stayed home, because if you play against me, my power deck will rip the stuffing out of your little oddish. Dang, this just makes me miss jerk rivals in the games again. I know you can kind of be the jerk rival in the latest gens, and Bead kind of fits that for a while, but it's just not the same. But yeah, Celestine drops some Paul vibes, similar here too, and Ava's all, I am so going to form a grudging respect for you and then you'll be sorry. Traitors, are you ready? We've literally already started. You didn't let me finish. Are you ready to continue? Yes. Look, I'm just glad it's not bingo again, all right? So Ava faces her first opponent, Tonio, who gives a weak joke that's elevated into a great one through animation and timing alone. Big props. At my first regionals, I was so nervous, I almost threw up. Actually, I did throw up. Anyway, call it! But after going into comic book time with how much she can say before the coin comes down, we get into it. All right, so what strats will she use? What's Tonio's specialty? Where's his weaknesses? She evolved her bounce suite. That's it? This is a freaking ad for the trading card game. Half the fun is cool strategies. How did she evolve bounce suite? She has the full stack there, so she didn't use rare candy. Was it luck or did she have a stalling tactic? I know the episodes are only 10 minutes long, but a quick, I still don't have Steeny. Maybe if I let him take Weedle as a sacrifice, would have just helped the engagement and the branding. I'm just surprised is all. But now it's time for the mid episode conflict. Hi kiddo, your friend invited me to play around. Holy crap, that is the sassiest trumpet sting I've heard in years. Did Celestine used to do TF2 tournaments? I'm taking it for dramatic stings in future projects. But yeah, she's psyching Ava out again, this time by embarrassing her dad, and her by proxy by wiping him out while he still has six prize cards. I win. <laughs> It's already over? <laughs> Unfortunately for Celestine, it just has the opposite effect, with Ava taking the evergreen advice of George Herbert, living well is the best revenge. Or as Frank Sinatra allegedly paraphrased it, the greatest revenge is massive success. So that means it's montage time, baby. 
once again without seeing any strats. Ugh. Celeste against Ava, who, uh, who's here to make a name for herself. Jeez, who hired that announcer? First asking people who are already playing if they're ready and now not being able to hype a finalist? It's your entire job. Here, the rising rookie. There, I thought of that in 30 seconds and you had the entire period between matches to think of something. Annoyance at fictional voices aside, Celestine shows some seriously nasty self-effacing narcissism. You do know they're not here for you, right? They're here for me, because I'm undefeated and they're hoping to see me lose. And oh come on, I love a good slow-mo shot, but just one strat, one, I'm begging you. At least she's staying hydrated. Relax, take a deep breath, and remember. Have fun. And it's yet another battle through allegory. I'm starting to see Tolkien's point here. But now we get the prideful villain speech and finally a strat. Wanna know my secret? Weakness. Everybody's got one. Yes, it's easy to forget Pokemon weaknesses, but if you keep them in mind, it can really give you an edge. I knew yours the moment I saw you. You rely on other people too much. What? She relies on... I, I just... Uh? Your overconfidence is your weakness. Your faith in your friends is yours. Not only is this an annoying dodge of actually discussing the mechanics, since freaking when has Ava relied on anyone? It's been the opposite case this whole episode. She got taught by Joshua, she was inspired by her dad, but not once has she been anything close to codependent. If she was constantly asking Joshua for advice or relying on her dad for emotional support, that'd be one thing, but I guess Celestine is just the worst reader of people? It's a good thing she never tried poker. Celestine's trapped Ava, and I think she's out of moves. Yes, trapped Ava, she's out of moves. Show us how, please! Luckily, before she blacks out, the crowd cheers her on, showing that relying on others can be a strength rather than a weakness, which would have hit harder if Ava ever did this beforehand. Ah! But finally, finally we get a proper strat. Hooray! Spoink's rapid bounce allows me to draw a cart, evolve gloom into vile food, and use dizzying polish. Granted, it's pot of greed into the heart of the cards, but it's something. I just wish they could pay off the relying on others point with something more relevant, like having Joshua give advice that she ignores until now, but fine. Wait, which one's heads and which one's tails? Pikachu has both. I guess this is me showing my ignorance as I've only really played online, but it still seems needlessly confusing. Just call it Ball or Mon or something. But then after the big defeat, we get this old but undeniably satisfying chestnut. Oh. Ava, I had a blast. I haven't felt like that in a long time. Screw you, you wiped out my dick purely to embarrass me. You wanna try out my dick? Buddy! Squeeze in and say cherry berry. Yeah, we're not gonna do that. Thoughts? The animation was still awesome, the art style and overall vibe was great, the characters and jokes were pretty fun and engaging, but and I can't believe I'm saying this, I really can't. I wish they advertised the product a little better. I understand the basic idea of what they're doing here. They want to associate the brand with a feeling rather than mechanics, which is more indelible and easier to milk for nostalgia points. But the reason people get nostalgic for games and trading card games in particular isn't just because of the fantasy inherent in the setting, although that is very important. It's also from memories of the strategies you put together, a clutch play from remembering a build you heard about, or realizing how freaking broken green black elves are. Even disregarding that, Yu-Gi-Oh for example is a very, very known franchise made immortal through nostalgia and its whole deal was blending the melodrama with actual, if sometimes fudged, mechanics from the game. I know it's only 10 minutes long, but you can still do quick explanations which would hopefully spark kids into trying something similar. What they do is fine, but I feel like it's a real missed opportunity. Game mechanics translate to real world relationships all the time, it's just a shame not to use that like a real sports anime would. Also just what the heck was up with that weirdly inaccurate character work at the end? It's like they wanted Celestine to get under Ava's skin by poking at her weaknesses and then realizing too late that they never gave her one and then just forcing one in. If they just sprinkled a few instances of Ava being over-reliant on others throughout the episode, it had come together way smoother, and that would only need one or two more passes at the script. I hope that the writers weren't crunched and forced to put in a first draft, and I hope they were paid residuals and compensated fairly union strong. <clears throat> I'd give it a great ball. I didn't not enjoy it, but it was still just frustrating. Trivia. I've mentioned this a few times during my journey through the anime, which is now being uploaded to Patreon for free, no membership required, plug plug, but it always throws me for a loop whenever Pokemon don't say their names, even though it's pretty much anime exclusive. Yeah, there are exceptions like Pikachu and a couple of others through the gens, but in all other media they just use their cries, which nowadays can sound just as weird, as these animals sound like old gay boy chipsets apparently. 
You'd also know this if you followed me for a while, but I am a bit of a storyboard evangelist. So many overlook storyboarding and animation in favor of the writing or the character animation, but the angles, comic timing, pacing, so much comes down to the storyboards. It's like the writing is the brain, the animation is the heart, but the storyboard is the lungs, the life breath. All are different, but you're going to have a really bad time without any of them. Oh, and by the way, in-betweeners are the liver and gallbladder. But yes, all that to say, one of the highlights of this series is the storyboarding, and one of the borders for this episode, Kiana Kahnsmith, released some of her work on Tumblr. I had to show these off because they often look way more dynamic and expressive than the finished product due to it being hard to go off model in 3D animation. It makes me wish she could do like a graphic novel set in the Pokemon world. It's actually funny since before landing this job, she was known for her fan comics that shipped Jesse Delia. <laughs> Come on, Pokemon, you've courted controversy with the religious crowd before. What's another one? Man, I freaking miss when these would be in DVD extras, whereas in Fresen streaming, it'd be so easy to just put them in. <sighs> oh, and with Joshua's thing about Oddish being a little unassuming, I could not mention Sejun Park and his adorable little Pachirisu, which carried him to victory in the 2014 World Champs. It was a real life sports anime moment. Check out the full swipe video about it. Link in the description. Who's that Patreon? It's Matt Stores. Matt Stores. What fandom interest or hobby have you not had a chance to talk about in your videos? Uh, probably Lego, traveling, and one other interest that I'm quite passionate about that I can't really mention here. I'm still looking for ways to implement all of them, so like, sub, and patronize if you want me to get enough income to pursue them. It's, it's Ryan and Sora and They ask, from any media you've watched or read, which character development is your favorite? Well, it's hard to beat Zuko because his dad already did it. But seriously, it's hard to make a massive prick with borderline war crimes under his belt likable, but they sure did pull that off in Avatar. However, he's not my favorite favorite. That fluctuates, but at the moment I'd probably say Dracula from Netflix Castlevania. Watch until the end of season two and disagree with me. I dare you. It's Arya Baruch. They ask, do you ever stroke your beard like an evil mastermind? If I could tolerate a beard, I would totally do that. Funny thing, this goatee is the full extent of my facial hair. The mustache never connects to the chin, and the cheeks and jaw are super patchy, partly due to surgery, so I can never do a proper Riker. It is certainly very strokeable still, and I am glad I at least got that. My oldest, oldest videos actually have me clean shaven, but once my beard came through, I've only gone back once to my spouse Leo's utter terror. Apparently it de-ages me like 10 years, and it made them feel like a gross sugar daddy. Well, after all that, what more is there to say but internationals. Extra special thanks to Brandon K, Calvin Atkinson, John G. Robertson, Jonathan Johnson, Matt Stores, Maurice Spear, Mystic Samurai 1983, The Dark Master, Trey McGowan, Winters King, and Wolf Raptor.